Well, good evening. Going to be lopsided again. Oh, well. Let's start with a word of prayer tonight. Father, we are thankful uh, always for your goodness. We're thankful for your grace and your love and your mercy. We're thankful for your word that instructs us and challenges us and, and uh, helps to teach us uh, the truth that we need to know, and, and we're grateful for that. We do pray as we meet together tonight that we would honor you, that we would lift you up as we sing and as we look into your word, and even as we bring our requests before you. We'll thank and we'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, hymn number 499 tonight, Sunshine in My Soul. It's supposed to be a rainy day today, but the rain never came down here. Did you get rain? I think south of us got rain, but we didn't get rain. I don't think. We could have left the laundry out and let it dry that way. Oh, well. There is sunshine in my soul today, more glorious and bright than those in any earthly sky. For Jesus is my light. Oh, there's sunshine, blessed sunshine, when the peaceful, happy moments roll. When Jesus shows his smiling face, there is sunshine in my soul. There is music in my soul today, a carol to my King. And Jesus listening can hear the songs I cannot sing. Oh, there's sunshine, blessed sunshine, when the peaceful, happy moments roll. When Jesus shows his smiling face, there is sunshine in my soul. There is springtime in my soul today, for when the Lord is near, the dove of peace sings in my heart, the flowers of grace appear. Oh, there's sunshine, blessed sunshine, the peaceful, happy moments roll. When Jesus shows his smiling face, there is sunshine in my soul. There is gladness in my soul today, and hope and love and praise for blessings which he gives me now, for joys and future days. Oh, there's sunshine, blessed sunshine, when the peaceful, happy moments roll. When Jesus shows his smiling face, there is sunshine in my soul. All right, what sunshine and blessings do we have this week? Or today? A new washer. <laughs> we had the blessing of a washer dying on Monday and new washer today, so we're back caught up on laundry. A Wi-Fi capable washer. What will they think of next? I don't know. Transportation that's not broken. We're, we're working on that. I got the list, and apparently there's a bunch of car parts coming tomorrow that won't get put on tomorrow. Wouldn't that be fun? I could just take cars apart tomorrow. What other blessings do we have? Good health. Healthy baby. Children. What? You don't have children? Good. <laughs> I think that runs contrary to the question being raised. Oh, so you're being thankful for parents. Oh, good. Sure. <laughs> 
Well, we got all sorts of help when we're about to make dumb decisions. For God's word. Oh, good. We're even talking about that tonight a little bit, but not for God's word, but correction. Why not? All right, we are in Proverbs chapter 28 tonight. The right blessings to seek. Uh, it's interesting, the, the, the type of blessings that people seek. I, I came across this, I think it was a website. Maybe it was a web list. Maybe it was a blog. I don't know. It looked like it was kind of an article format. And it was, was it, it wasn't low key ways. But it was something along the lines of low key ways to tell you're rich. And uh, it was definitely an interesting perspective for the American mindset. Someone posted uh, their, their way that they knew they were rich was they just bought a house and it had a basketball hoop in the driveway. And it cracked me up because the picture was of one of those portable basketball hoops that you fill with sand or water at the base. And, uh, and I thought, okay. You just bought a house, probably well over $100,000 for it, and you're excited about a $200 basketball hoop. That, that's what proves that you're rich. But when you think about it, to be able to have the disposable income to get a basketball hoop and have a place to live, that's something. And, and then the list went on to other ways that, that most Americans take for granted, the things that they have, that people were labeling, this is how I know I'm, it wasn't, it wasn't, it's kind of like under the radar ways to, to, to recognize your wealth. And it was a, it wasn't meant to be a contentment article, but it was one of those meant to kind of shift our perspective at how we look at the things we have. The right blessings to seek. The uh, Proverbs tries to do the same thing to us. It tries to adjust our perspective to see things in a different light and to to understand things from God's way rather than the way of the world. Uh, our main idea tonight is that the easy path does not often lead to blessing. Now, we know that. Uh, if, if, what was it, uh, Three Lakes Cafe, or I think it's Three Lakes Cafe, just opened in Casadega on Monday, and uh, it's a Panama grad and her husband that opened it opened it and uh, they said they keep kept reminding themselves through the process they purchased the building last December and they've spent all of this time getting the inside and the outside ready, the menu, their suppliers, their business plan, all of those things together and just barely were ready to open. I think they probably would have said if they had just had one or two more days or weeks or months they'd be all ready. and. and and they were able to open it. And they said numerous times, we kept reminding ourselves, if it were easy, everyone would do it. And the easy path does not often lead to blessing. There's a poster up at the, in the school. It says, if you want to be in the top 1% of anything, you have to do what the 99% are not willing to do. The easy path does not often lead to blessings. Now, Proverbs isn't going to tell us that the path to blessings is impossible. It's just going to tell us we don't want to choose the easy way. Uh, Proverbs 28, verse 19. He that tilleth his land shall have plenty of bread, but he that followeth after vain persons shall have poverty enough. Now, I tilled this year. I tilled the church's land. But I guess his land, I have access to it. It's mine to use. Shall have plenty of bread. Uh-oh. We have gluten-free people around the house. We don't need bread. But you get the idea, right? He that tilleth his own land has his needs met. And what we see in verse 19, as far as the easy path doesn't lead to blessings, and choosing the right blessings to seek, we see that labor brings more blessings than vanity. Now, this is an obvious one, right? Dave Ramsey tells the story of when he was a kid, he asked his dad, hey, dad, I need money for this. And his dad goes, no, you don't. He goes, yes, I do, dad. He goes, nope, what you need is a job. 
because money comes from jobs. And he said, my dad says, what are you going to do to start your own business? And I can't remember how old Dave said he was at the time, 10, 12, 14, somewhere in there. He says, well, I could do people's lawns. And so his dad said, hop in the car. And they went down to a printer and they bought 500 business cards that said Dave's Lawn Care or something. And he got home and his dad says, now you go to the 50 houses nearest our house, dress nicely, knock on the door, give them a card and say, I'd like the privilege or the opportunity to mow your lawn. And uh, he said, that summer I did 39 lawns out of the 50. He goes, that's child abuse. <laughs> I don't think he really means it was child abuse, but he learned that labor produces income. And Solomon says, labor brings more blessing than vanity, brings more blessing than vanity. Well, he that tilleth his land. And he said, well, I don't have land. I don't have a tiller. I don't need a garden. I, well, let's break that down. He that tilleth his own land, he that adds labor to what he has available, that takes what he has and adds labor to it. Uh, if you uh, if you need money and you're working, well, out here in the country, probably not the, the biggest thing, but if you were in town and uh, you bought a bucket and a squeegee, you could go around and wash windows. You could invest like $5 and you could make lots of $5 every day by washing windows. Well, you took what you had available and you added labor to it. He that adds labor to what he has available has plenty of bread, plenty of provision, needs being met. But he that followeth after vain persons shall have poverty enough. Well, this is pretty easy to spot in our world today, vain persons. Uh, in California, they just raised the fast food minimum wage to $20 an hour. And people are saying there's already a movement that says the, fat, the minimum wage for all jobs in California needs to be raised to $30 an hour. There's also groups of people that say we need to cut back our work week because 40 hours a week is too much. We need to have time for leisure. You know, 40 hours out of the 168 hours we have in a week is too much. We need to cut that back to three weeks. I'm not picking on you. There's a whole group that we just we need leisure. We got to be able to enjoy. And there's a lot of vain persons pursuing amusement, pursuing rest, pursuing relaxation as a lifestyle. It's good to relax. It's good to kick back. It's good to take a break. God to told us we should work six days and rest on the seventh. There's rest that God has built in, but there are people that view it as a goal to be able to rest all the time. Well, that's not good for us. He that follows vain persons, frivolity, and it says shall have poverty enough. What's interesting is if, if you wanted to translate the same word, because the same word appears in that verse twice, if you wanted to translate it the same way, uh, it would be he that tilleth his land shall have enough bread, but he that followeth after vain persons shall have enough poverty. Or we could translate it the other way, he that tilleth his land shall have plenty of bread, but he that followeth after vanity or vain persons shall have plenty of poverty. That would be translating the same word the same way. Solomon's hooking those things together. You can get plenty of your needs being met or plenty of poverty, depending on what you chase after. Vanity. We live in a vain world. Vanity. Amusement. People that seek after amusing themselves the whole time. Amuse is a great word. A means without and muse means to think. So if you chase after without thinking, you get without blessing. He that follows vain persons shall have plenty of poverty. So seeking or labor brings more blessing than vanity.
which is a pretty obviously one. Now, we have to balance that, right? Because you could say, ah, if labor brings more blessing, I just need to work, 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 and it's all up to me. But that leaves out part of what we know Scripture says. So a good thing in verse 20, we go on to, a faithful man shall abound with blessings. Wow, tilling your own land, plenty of bread, faithful man shall abound with blessings. Work and trust in God. Those are the first two things that bring blessings. Seeking God brings more blessings than seeking wealth. Verses 20 through 22 kind of circles around this same thing because in verse 20 it says, He that maketh, maketh haste to be rich. Verse 22 talks about he that hasteth to be rich. Seeking God brings more blessings than seeking wealth. So but didn't you just say you, you need to be working? Well, you'll notice that the, the labor from verse 19 wasn't about how much money can I make? The labor was just on the basis of working with what you have and using what you have produces more blessing than vanity. And seeking God brings more blessings than seeking wealth. So what if we seek God and labor with our hands? Make use of what we have. Add labor to it. Well, then we're stacking blessings. Seeking God brings more blessing than seeking wealth. Verse 19 or verse 20 tells us that a faithful man shall abound with blessings, but he that maketh haste to be rich shall not be innocent. Seeking God is better than seeking riches. Verse 21, to have respect of persons is not good for a piece of bread. That man will transgress. So how does that have to do with hasting to be rich? Well, respect of persons means I treat people differently based on what I think I can get out of them what I think they could do for me. There's uh, lots of setup videos that, that you can find on, on the internet that talk about things like this, where the guy walks into the car dealership and he doesn't look like he has much money and they treat him badly, but then one car salesman treats him well and he ends up being a multimillionaire that could buy all the cars on the lot if he wanted to and the other ones miss out on the sale. Well, the thing is, it's not a matter of what they have, but even having respect of persons. When you treat the person that has millions of dollars differently than you treat the person that doesn't have millions of dollars, you have respect of persons. Why would someone have respect of persons? Does money make a person a better person? I like Dave Ramsey's take on that. <laughs> money, money just makes you more of what you already are. <laughs> A good person that has money will do good things with it. A bad person that has money will do bad things with it. But there is sin when we treat people well or badly based on how we perceive they could bless us. Well, why would we treat someone differently based on what we could get out of them? Because there's a desire for wealth, riches, or blessing more than how we treat people. And following God, seeking God, brings more blessing than seeking wealth. And God says we need to treat all people the same. We need to treat people well. Verse 22, He that hasteth to be rich hath an evil eye, and considereth not that poverty shall come upon him. Seeking wealth brings poverty. That's what that verse tells us. Well, that can't be right. If you're seeking wealth, how does that lead to poverty? Well, he that hasteth to be rich. If riches is your goal, then you're not going to do very well. Uh, career counselors, people come in and ask career counselors sometime, I want to make lots of money, what should I be? And a good career counselor will say, uh, you're asking the wrong question. The right question is, what do you want to do? What would you enjoy doing? Because if you seek what you enjoy doing and you serve others well, then you'll be more successful than if you just seek after the bottom line and money. But seeking wealth, hasting to be rich brings poverty. Here's the problem with the lottery. You know, they get the big, 
it's a nine hundred million dollar or a four point four billion dollar payout. I don't know what the payouts have been lately. They've been up there five hundred and fifty million, seven hundred million, and people will go, "Oh, I should buy a ticket because you can't win if you don't play." But you have to remember, you can't win if you do play, either. It's the same thing. Yes, you can win, but it's very astronomical against there. But the problem with gambling, is, the problem with buying the lottery ticket isn't necessarily gambling. The problem with buying the lottery ticket is he that hasteth to be rich hath an evil eye. Hmm. The purpose for buying a lottery ticket, do you suppose that's just someone testing their ability to pick out a series of numbers? Or is there a desire to become rich quick? That purchase of the lottery ticket isn't wrong because it's gambling. It's wrong because it's hasting to be rich. It's got our heart in the wrong place. Well, yeah, but if I won that, I'd do really good things with it. The church would never have financial need again. I would set the church up. If I won $550 million and I would help this person and this person and this group and this group and I do all these great things with the money. But he that hasteth to be rich hath an evil eye and considereth not that poverty which shall come upon him. I heard the story of a barber that was cutting a guy's hair and the barber shared with the guy, yeah, I won the lottery several years ago. Uh, the guy was kind of curious why this guy is cutting his hair when he won millions of dollars. And he said, so what happened? He goes, well, I won the money and I didn't get any advice and I paid off my mortgage and my kids' mortgages and, and this other person, maybe it was parents' mortgage, and I bought everybody new cars and uh, sooner than I knew it, all the money was gone and I still have to work. <laughs> Hasted to be rich and uh, came to poverty. Well, I guess no worse off than he was to begin with, other than kicking himself. But it's also a problem not just for the lottery, but when we seek money as a goal. Seeking God brings more blessings than seeking wealth. Verse 23, He that rebukes a man afterward shall find more favor than he that flattereth with the tongue. When it comes to personal relationships, we sometimes think, well, if I tell people what they want to hear, that's going to help relationships better than bringing correction or rebuke. But Solomon says correction brings more blessing than flattery. Friend comes and says, hey, I'm thinking about doing this. Should I do it? Remember Micaiah the prophet? Like, You're going to die in battle. King says, see, this guy always prophesies bad about me. Okay, so, oh, go and the Lord will bless you in the battle. You know, oh no, it was go and the Lord will bless you. That's what he said first. And the king says, how often do I have to tell you? Speak only the truth. And he goes, well, you go and you're going to die. See, I said he'd only say bad things about me. We well, said, well, if you flatter, then people will like you more, right? Solomon says, he that rebukes a man afterward shall find more favor than he that flattereth with the tongue. We seek blessing sometimes in how we think people will respond to us by telling them what we think they want to hear. But Solomon says, telling people the truth, rebuking when they're wrong, correction and rebuke, get a better response than flattery. Get a better consequence than flattery. Well, why? Well, because the people know that there's honesty that comes from you and they can trust that. They know that they are a better person when they receive correction than when they are flattered for whatever they're involved in that might be wrong. Correction brings more blessing than flattery. And then we're going to skip a few verses down to verse 27 um, because it goes along with the hasting to be rich. He that giveth unto the poor shall not lack, but he that hideth his eyes shall have many a curse. Generosity brings more blessing than selfishness. It does not make sense. We might look and say, oh, yes, but I can think of someone that was generous that lost all their money. 
right? Like the prodigal son. Was the prodigal son generous? Oh, I see one no. Why not? Well, he took others along for the ride. But, but you hit the nail on the head there. He spent it on things he wanted to do. Sometimes we can disguise what we want to do as generosity. Oh, uh, I'm going to treat someone to this because that's what I want to do. But if I take someone else along for the ride, I can call it generosity. That's what the prodigal son did. He took other people along for the ride and he would have called, considered himself generous. But generosity has to do with meeting needs. And the prodigal son did not meet anyone's needs. He fed people's wants. And he fed his own wants. He blessed people for his own enjoyment, enjoyment and blessed wants being met, not needs. Generosity, we can see it here in verse 27. He that giveth unto the poor. Uh, here in the U.S., we don't actually have that many poor. We can see them around us. Uh, but for the most part, you know, we live in a very wealthy country. But the poor, we can understand more about what generosity is when we see the, the but statement. But he that hideth his eyes shall have many a curse. Generosity is seeing a need and meeting it. Giving to meet a need that we see. Not hiding our eyes from the need that's there. Now in the world that we live in, that takes discernment. Well, how do I know if so-and-so really needs it or not? Or how do I know if this is... It takes wisdom and it takes discernment. And I still appreciate when we were at Bethel Baptist Church in Jamestown, when we were first married... The pastor there, Pastor Dan, we had a food pantry, and he, out of his own pocket, bought gas coupons. Uh, we'd call them gift cards today, but I don't know if they had the gift cards back then. I think they were like $20 quick fill certificates that he would buy, that he would give to people that came to the food pantry that expressed a need. And uh, I asked him one time, I said, well, you know the gas station sells cigarettes and lottery tickets and all of that and and he goes well I figure my job is to meet a need when I see it and if they use it wrong that's not on me and I'd rather meet a need and maybe have some of that wasted than to turn away from a need that was actually there uh, well, there's an interesting perspective. I think you might have read Proverbs 28, 27. He that hideth his eyes shall have many a curse. Generosity brings more blessing than selfishness. Sharing what we have brings more blessing than keeping what we have to ourselves. So, but mathematically, that doesn't work. Well, mathematics is important, but that's not the entire picture here. When we look at what brings blessing, uh, we see that our labor, we see that being faithful, seeking God, being truthful with others, and meeting needs are all things that bring blessing. Not things that come naturally, because naturally we would say, well, I'm... I'm going to hold on to what I have because then I'll have more. I'm going to tell people what they want to hear because then they'll like me more. I'm, I'm going to seek wealth because if I don't seek it, how am I going to get it? And uh, boy, an easy life sounds better than, than working hard. And God says, nope, wisdom is seeking blessings the right way. We are going to go offline.